Hello, and as promised recently, we are publishing a great interview video of one of the most influential men in modern watchmaking, Mr. Jean-Claude Biver. And by influential, I mean a man whose contribution has been extremely significant in making what mechanical watchmaking is today. Something difficult to argue, and when we think back at the standing ovation he received during the last GPHG ceremony, well, this reflects pretty well the respect the industry has for him. So we took our watchmobile on the early morning, headed to Jean-Claude Beaver's beautiful private home overlooking the Geneva Lake, and you will learn more about the man, his career, how he got into watchmaking, his views on today's situation, his vision, his future, and I must say that he's been super transparent and personal about all this. So before starting, I would just like to add that one of Mr. Beaver's immense strengths is his opportunism, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but rather a clever way of developing and coming with products wanted by customers, finding ways of communicating this with efficient and adapted means. Well, he has always been in tune with what consumer wants. He listens and adapts instead of imposing what he feels would be the truth, something that we don't always witness in the industry. Okay, and since the interview is pretty long, well, we edited a few things and divided this into two parts, and I will now shut up, and off we go for an inspiring moment. So, can you explain us a little bit how you came into watchmaking? What uh, was the trigger? The trigger was that I didn't want to work first. And uh, as Confucius said, if you don't want to work, make your daily work uh, a passion. And I had no passion. So I had to find a passion. <laughs> I had the idea to try to find what was the toy I liked when I was a boy. And I had the toy, which was somehow one of my passion. It was the toy I liked the most, was a steam machine. And one day, a friend of mine, Jacques Piguet, who is the owner of Frédéric Piguet, the famous movement maker, uh, had a watch on his wrist with no dial. Uh, and inside uh, the watch, there was the Calibre FP70, which is Frédéric Piguet 70, which is the automatic ultra slim, 2.45 millimeter thick, uh, with a central rotor, which was in those days the slimmest automatic movement. Uh, and he had it on the wrist with, exact, with no dial, nothing. He was testing the, the, the movement. And I looked at it, and I said, but this looks like a steam machine. And he said, what? I said, yes, it looks somehow like a steam machine. Uh, <laughs> and you see, I'm wearing today uh, at, at, uh, the bigger bang is the name. It's a um, tubio, and it's skeleton also, and also the back. So I have not changed, in fact. I this is my, 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 that's the watch I, I wear every day. Uh, and so we decided, Jack and myself, that <laughs> a movement, uh, when you look at it, can be interpreted like the evolution of my toy. That was my thinking. This is the dog huh, who makes this noise. He's snorkeling a little bit. It's a, a French bulldog. <laughs> and they love their master. So wherever I go, he comes uh, uh, next to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that was, that, that day, I knew that I would have a passion for watches. So it was not born, I was not born with a passion with watches. I looked for a passion and I found the watch. And, and what kind of studies did you, did you go through? I studied uh, business. I was at a, a business school at the University of Lausanne. Business and watchmaking has nothing to do together. It has very little if I, even to do together, because that is why you find these names, Audemars Piguet, Jégo Le Coult, Vacheron Constantin, Favre Le Bas, uh, etc. Because the watchmakers have always been associated the watchmaker and the commercial, because between watchmaker and to have to do marketing and traveling, go around the world, speak different languages, it's another world. So um, I studied uh, uh, business and I had this passion for watches. And so uh, I, I applied to Audemars Piguet 
because I met, thanks to Jacques Piguet again, the boss of Audema Piguet, the, the, the CEO, and he gave me an appointment. Uh, he then said to me, you're going to work for one year with half salary. You're going to work f during one year with no traveling, with no office, with no secretary, with no phone line, and with no name cards. I said, well, 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 what will I do? He said, you're going to learn what the watchmaking art means. You're going to learn who the watchmakers are. You're going to learn the mentality of uh, the uh, uh, watchmakers. You're going to learn the history of Omar Piguet. You're going to learn the concept, the philosophy of our brand. And once you have that, after one year, you're going to travel and you're going to go around Europe and promote my brand. So for one year, for one year, you have to pay me half salary. So I said to the CEO, Mr. Gole, I said, you mean you pay me only half? He said, yes, because the other half is for me, because you are doing nothing, you are just studying. So you have to pay your study. <laughs> I went home, I said, God damn, I get only half salary and I have no traveling, and I have no uh, name card, and I have no phone, and I have no office. So my wife said, but what will you do? And I, I told her the same again. Uh, I will work, uh, I will study. <laughs> and slowly, slowly, I started to understand the people. I played football with the watchmakers. I went skiing with the watchmakers. They taught me about cheese. This is why I make cheese today. Uh, they, I visited their homes, I, I became friends with this. So I, suddenly, after one year, I was totally integrated uh, among the watchmakers. And not, I didn't know anybody from marketing or, or from sales, because I was never with these guys, and I never met them even. And I became uh, totally uh, uh, integrated in the valley, in the political uh, 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 space, in the economical space, in the sports space, because I, I, I was just a member of the community. For my first traveling, my first, uh, yeah, my, my first presentation in Germany, I went with no watches. And the guy said, but you come to sell watches? I said, yes, but where are they? Do you have a bag? I said, no. But how can you sell watches if you don't show me the watches? I said, because I want first to explain you who we are, why we are, uh, uh, like, uh, what, is, what is our product, uh, what is our concept, what is our philosophy, uh, where we come from, what is our history. And once you seem to be convinced and interested, then I will show you the product. But I cannot show you the product before I explain you who we are. And the guy was very uh, amazed. He said, wow, I've been very long in business. You are the first salesman who comes with no watches to show. <laughs> in those days, it was a little bit like today, um, except there were very few uh, brands, much fewer than today. Uh, and we had, with Olma Pige, we, uh, we had three competitors. We had Patek, we had Vacheron, and sometimes we said we also have Piaget. So we were three. <laughs> Number two, today most of the brands belong to other people, uh, to the groups and not to private people. So you have to fight against group. No, if you, if you, uh, Blampa, uh, uh, belong, or Glasshütte belongs to Swatch Group, and, and they have 19 brands, they have a certain power. You have uh, Vachon, uh, uh, who belongs to, to, to Richemont, also power. So you are fighting against power also. So how long did you stay uh, by uh, Audemars Piguet? I stayed, not, I stayed um, only uh, five years. And uh, I regretted that I had to leave because after five years, in the end of 79, uh, I asked Mr. Gole, after five years, I said, listen, I've been now five years with you. I have a lot of ideas. I have also ideas how, what we could change. And uh, when do you expect me to have a promotion? 
And he said, but we are a very small team. We have only two salesmen. Um, you will have a promotion for sure in 14 years. Because in 14 years, I will be 65. And I will retire from the operational matters. And uh, you will have a promotion. I said, no way. I cannot wait 14 years. Plus, when you are 29 or 30, plus 14, this is 43 years old. When you are 40, when you are 30 and you think somebody is 44, that's an old man, 44. So I said, I cannot wait. I have to leave. And by chance, my brother worked uh, at um, Omega at, in the timekeeping department. He was the boss of Omega timekeeping. And uh, one day, the um, marketing manager of, and boss of Omega, Fritz Amann, asked my brother, is this, uh, he, he, is Jean-Claude Beaver, who works at uh, uh, AP, is he related to your family? And my brother said, yeah, yeah, it's my brother. Wow, he's doing a good job, I heard, in Germany and in Europe. Uh, tell him that uh, if one day he wants to talk to me, I would like to invite him. <laughs> it entered here and it stayed, round. And I said, yeah, it's a great opportunity. Mr. Gole is telling me 14 years to wait. I will not want to wait. So I joined Omega. That was end of 79. I started at Omega. And at what, what was the kind of the condition of the watchmaking industry at that time? Because, I mean, we're kind of talking middle of the quartz crisis there. The quartz crisis came really in 1981. But in 79, it was already uh, uh, growing. And the Swiss were trying to catch up um, in the technology. And that was a miss interpretation of the problem. It was, it was just the reverse that happened. We came back through, uh, <laughs> thanks to the mechanical watch, but, 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 and very people know that, or very, people, very few people have noticed it. Swatch, that came out, I think, in 81 or 82, uh, was a genius idea of Mr. Hayek, senior, because he said to reconquer uh, our position, we must first enable uh, 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 the industry to have quantities. Quantities, we cannot ju just do exclusivity. Quantities in order to have a large base, industrial base. This industrial base can only come if we are able to sell millions of watches uh, in order to amortize uh, the, the cost of the industry. Millions of watches which for Swiss mentality was unheard. Uh, and we must have the highest quality for the cheapest price. And we will uh, build a new concept of watches in plastic uh, where the machine has replaced the human being uh, as much as possible because labor is so expensive in Switzerland compared to it, what it was in Japan or other countries. And he invented Swatch. Swatch means S like Swiss and watch, Swiss watch. So he invented the Swiss watch in plastic at an extraordinary price, $50. And the Swatch went into exclusive distribution. Uh, Swatch also promoted the brand as a fashion brand and not like a cheap brand. Um, uh, so the Swatch became very successful because for 50 Swiss francs, you had a Swiss quality watch on your wrist and you had a watch that had a personality that was different, uh, that was fun, that was joy of life, that was colorful, and you could wear not only one, but several. And, and you could offer a watch to your kids because uh, till, till the birth of Swatch, Children, they had to be 15 or 18 years old before wearing a watch because nobody would invest for a child at 12 years old or 8 years old to buy a watch. But Swatch, yes, because it was $50 and it was fun. And these kids became watch conscious because they have grown up with a watch on the wrist, which means when they became tw adults, 20, 25, 30 years old, which was 20 years after 1980, which is uh, at the end of the 90s, 
these boys and these girls, they were buying a watch in a normal way. This is why I say today, when we see so many young people with no watch on the wrist, I say that's a problem. I hope Apple will be able to sell a lot to these youngsters. And like this, it's easier to sell a watch to somebody that has worn a watch already than somebody that has never worn a watch for 40 years. It's a big difference. So mechanical watch helped to save the Swiss industry, but also indirectly Swatch also helped. So the two, you see, the two helped to bring the Swiss back. And at Omega at the time, what was kind of the portion of watches that were going just uh, quartz, in the quartz direction to, uh, in respect to mechanical? Omega was dreaming to have 100% quartz. Uh, and in 1979, how much was the, the, the part of quartz? I don't really remember, but it tended to be 50% already or 40. Uh, but the, the projection was to increase. And every new watch we were bringing uh, to our collection, people were asking, is it quartz? Yes, wow, let me see. If we would have said it's mechanical, oh no. So quartz was really the, you know, the, the hook, the, uh, the important element. And there were you taking care of the commercial aspect or were you already taking care of marketing? Uh, I was taking care of marketing and sales and product for the gold department. In 1979, Omega decided to reinforce gold watches, to promote them differently from steel because the price was different and Omega believed they should handle precious metal, gold or platinum uh, or diamonds differently than a, a steel watch. And the shape should also be different. We had problems to sell an expensive watch in steel in many countries. Italy, no. It, the Italian immediately understood the chic to have steel at a high price. Uh, in France, it was OK. Uh, in Switzerland, OK. In Germany, more difficult. In Japan, pfft, in the beginning, impossible. So uh, there was a lot of rejection because people said, oh, I don't want to spend all this money for a steel watch. You know, in those days, Omega, I, I don't know, I had maybe 4,000 retailers. You cannot sell to 4,000 people a gold watch. Um, so it made sense to have the two uh, to have a separate department. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long did you stay then at Omega? I didn't stay very long because the crisis came uh, very soon. And in 1982, I had the opportunity to buy Blanpa. <coughs> and uh, with Jacques Piguet, the guy who helped me to find my, my passion. Uh, with Jacques, we bought uh, Blanpa, I think in November 82. We bought, when I say we bought Blanpa, we bought a name because Blanpa had stopped to produce watches in 59 or 60. <clears throat> so from 1960 to 82, 22 years, they had disappeared. They had even disappeared. There was no catalogs. There was no, no, no collection, of course. There were no employees. There were no, no uh, plant, no factory, uh, no contracts, no distribution, nothing. We just bought the name, Blanc, Pain, boom, that's it. And uh, that's why we, we paid only 22,000 Swiss francs. And then in 1983, we started. And where did we start? We started in the Valley de Joux, uh, next to my house where I lived when I was at AP. There was a farm there and we have uh, rent the farm. Later we bought it. Uh, we rented the farm for $300 a month. And uh, we had uh, three or four watchmakers and myself. And we started Blopa from scratch. <laughs> and uh, it was, and, and we were very disruptive somehow because we said in our communication, since 1735, there has, there has never been a quartz Blopa watch and there will never be one. Boom. Technology is due to become obsolete, is due to be killed, is due to be useless. 
because you cannot find the batteries, you cannot find the chips anymore, it's gone. Art is eternal. Watchmaking art, which we have heritated from the past, will never become obsolete. It might go out of fashion, it might go out of taste, but it will never, it will never die. Big Ben is not a quartz watch on the, on the top of the tower. <laughs> it's a mechanical watch, and they celebrated 150 years. There is no machine that is working every day. Big Ben works every day, every second. And it still works after 150 years. You know, I, I was a hippie in 1968, 69, 70, 71. I even lived in a commune. And uh, when we were a kind of ecology, we are the ecological watch, the watch with no battery. And battery on your wrist, you know, is not the healthiest thing to have, to have a battery on your wrist. It's like you cannot sleep with the phone next to your head, you know. Uh, put it a little bit away. So uh, all these elements helped us to promote our, our, our brand and also our art. And people immediately um, were able to understand what is a product that comes from an industry, that comes from an, in, from an industrial process, and this is a product that comes from art, that comes from a tradition, that comes from a culture. Our performance was incredible because we came out <laughs> within between 83 and 89 with ultra slim, with moon phase, with perpetual calendar, with tourbillon, with chrono split, and with miniature Peter. And in 1989, with the grand complication, which has all the six in one. And we were the oldest watch brand in the world, 1735. We are producing the watches by hand. Every watch maker was doing, making one at the time. Um, this made us becoming totally different from others. And I always say, if you are first different, unique, you cannot lose. You know, entrepreneur is not necessarily linked to owning the company. Entrepreneur is a mentality. And if you have an entrepreneurial mentality, if you work for somebody, or if you work for yourself, uh, you will act in the same way. Entrepreneur can only exist with freedom. If, <laughs> if you bring the entrepreneur into a cage, if you limit his activities, he will become a manager. And he will manage the surface. You give him so much room, he will manage this room. This is why uh, at LVMH, for instance, uh, every brand is extraordinarily free. Uh, there are very few regulations on purpose, because if you regulate too much, you will, end, uh, you will end up by having only managers. But let's go back to uh, Blancpain. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit then uh, what uh, happened for you in the, uh, with Blancpain? Well, we, be we, we became extraordinarily successful, exceptionally successful. And uh, in 1992, uh, we sold the brand. Jacques Piguet had no uh, successors. He had uh, two daughters. And uh, I, had, uh, I went through a divorce. I went through a certain uh, crisis, also a personal crisis, uh, which brought both of us uh, to sell the brand to Swatch Group. Later, after I sold it, I asked Mr. Hayek if I could work. And I always remember, he said, you want to work? But you just sold the company a few weeks ago. I said, yes, I want to work because uh, I have sold my passion. And uh, I have also sold my people. And today, I cannot tell you that I regret, but somehow, I, something is missing. I need back to manage my company. I need back my people. And he said, OK, if you want to come back, you, I can give you a job. But your job will not be limited to Blampa. I want you to help me also to restructure Omega. I said, oh, no, no. I was already once in uh, Omega. No, but now we, are, we, we want to bring Omega up. Uh, and you understand uh, luxury. 
uh, you understand uh, what is a premium brand, so you are the right person to help me, and I would like to give you marketing and product of Omega. That's where we need a fresh input, that's where we need you. So I finished to accept the job, and I took, uh, in 1992, I joined Swatch Group. I entered the board of uh, directors in 1993, and I took care of Omega in Blancpain. And at Omega, I had an extraordinary uh, period of time, extraordinary. Uh, I brought back uh, James, I brought back, uh, James Bond had never worn a, 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 an Omega. I brought uh, James Bond to Omega. I uh, took uh, Cindy Crawford, with whom we were the first brand to activate her not to have just a, a picture on a Vogue magazine, but to have her as a real ambassador that goes with me or with us around the world, promotes watches, uh, has, has a lot of appearance days, is involved in the design. So she played a real role, uh, like a, a not, she was not, not just an ambassador. And uh, I brought back also the moon, the whole uh, story of NASA, and Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. Um, and it was extraordinary because we, we tripled the turnover between 93 and 1999. <laughs> and we were extraordinarily successful uh, by res uh, restructuring the, 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 whole, the whole company. You know, before 1970, uh, Omega was leading compared to Rolex. And this reversed during the quartz period in the 70s. And uh, when I was there in 1992, uh, Rolex had gone and we were behind. Um, but it was still a very well-known brand all over the world. But the proportions, we cannot say in every country we were successful. We had to build success again, and the first country where I built success, where I, I tried to, to build up something, was China. Because again, uh, every brand uh, were, uh, took it as an outlet country, and we were the only ones to work it differently. You know, when you are contrarian, you have less competition, <laughs> because you go reverse. Blancpain, we went contrarian. We, we, so we were, we were ahead with Omega, we were contrarian. We worked first China, and then we worked India. And people said, but why don't you go to America? We have time. We, in, and in America, we have so much competition. Let's go first to China, because it's easier, because we are alone. So it was a logic, and that helped Omega a lot, and that is why Omega is now so strong in China. And you were mentioning before that, uh, I mean, companies, it's good if, if they can be their own little players and fight a little bit. But at uh, Swatch Group, it's an, another type of uh, philosophy where brands are pretty well positioned and segmented and things like that. How did you live that? No, easily I was very much in favor. When you have many brands, you must be careful that you don't have overlapping. Because <laughs> if you have uh, uh, three brands that sells uh, at, uh, I say anything now, at 20,000 Swiss francs retail, uh, then each one will compete. But if you, if you cover all the segments, all the different price segments, and in each price segment you have one or two players, that's reasonable. And that was uh, quite, quite clever from Swatch Group to have uh, uh, complementary uh, brands and to cover from 50 Swiss francs to, uh, in those days, 50,000. For each segment, they had one, eventually two brands. I joined in 93, and I left uh, the board of directors of Swatch Group in 2003. So I stayed 10 years. I stayed 10 years. In those 10 years, what would you say were the most significant development or changes of the industry at the time? I, it was the, 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 the move uh, into mechanical again. And that was a big challenge because uh, brands like Omega had no knowledge anymore, more or less, because the toolings and the movements 
and the people even, had all been uh, thrown out in the 80s. And in the 90s, we had to <laughs> reinvent, rehire people. And that was a big change because it was an industrial change. Boom. From 90% quartz, we went back to 70% uh, mechanical. So it's just reverse. That was a quite a, uh, uh, it was a difficult move, very difficult move. And suddenly uh, in the 90s, uh, we saw the, the, the groups, the merger, and, and, and suddenly you had three big groups. And if you include uh, Rolex as a group, or Patek, because the turnover is similar to a group uh, uh, perception, you have five groups. Uh, and these five groups, how much turnover of the Swiss watch industry do they do? Uh, I would say 90%. <laughs> so 90% belongs to five groups. That's a heavy concentration. I believe uh, when you are in a group, I believe in the independency of each brand, very important so that each brand has its own message, never own product, own price segment, own R&D. And then on the distribution network, they can, have, can work together because there are some synergies. Uh, on the buying, they can have some synergies. If uh, uh, purchasing, you know, um, in marketing, should be also independent, but you can also eventually have a few synergies. We should, in a big group, try to keep the independency of the important elements, which is the philosophy of the brand, which is the product of the brand, which is the message of the brand, which is the product of the brand. And then, if we have different competences, and we have an extraordinary guy who makes extraordinary invention. And suddenly the brand says, I cannot absorb. I have already four new movements. I cannot put a fifth one. But if this movement is extraordinary, why can I not give it to another brand, which, which I call the synergies of competences? So if I have a great guy here, he can help me. If uh, I have an extraordinary product manager, with extraordinary, fantastic vision, extraordinary competences. Uh, why can he not come to a product committee of another brand just to observe and give his opinion? So uh, this is my belief. If you see uh, the Audi group, they have Audi, they have Volkswagen, and they have Porsche. Okay, they have also Skoda now, but... Uh, uh, Sometimes they use the same uh, base, the same chassis. Uh, but at the end, they can also use from time to time the same engine. But at the end, the Porsche is still a Porsche, the Audi is still an Audi. Another chapter in 2003, I left Swatch Group. I left first for one year sabbatical year. And this sabbatical year transformed into, uh, into Hublot, because I had known Mr. Coco uh, in 1984, 83, 84, 85. So I had known him because he was selling our products, and I have also known him because he was buying our products. So I had uh, uh, quite a frequent relation with him. And in, in 2004, when I had this sabbatical year, I met him. And uh, he said, listen, uh, eventually, can you help me? Um, I'm a little bit uh, tired, and uh, I would like to, to see if you can help contribute to, to the development of Hublot, which was not growing so much anymore. Uh, the last, they had a peak in 2000, and then 2001, 2, 3, was uh, slight, slightly going down. And I said, yes, why not? This will be for me a new start. It's like if I would be in a new uh, startup. Because in 2004, when I joined, we were doing 26 million turnover. And we had uh, 38 people. So it was not a 100% startup. 
but it was close to a startup. And I said, this is exciting. I want to start again. And I like the startup mentality. I like to be disruptive. I had some friends who said, are you crazy? You have played in the, it's like if you play in the Champions League, uh, soccer, and suddenly you start with a fourth Liga uh, of a small village and play there. You're going to destroy yourself. You should stay at Swatch Group, uh, or at least you should play in a Champions League uh, club. But you already had a clear vision of how to go up there clear. to the Champions League? Clear vision. I must say, I had a clear vision about Hublot, yes. Because I thought that the watch had a huge potential be because uh, of the product that was rubber and gold. I saw, hey, if you handle gold and rubber, this is a fusion. People say, well, a fusion, what is a fusion? I said, but listen, gold and rubber can never meet because gold is under the earth in South Africa mostly. And rubber is in Malaysia and in Brazil on the tree. So these two elements cannot meet. They have only met once when they were in the Big Bang because then everything was one. And the Big Bang came, pow, and the rubber went on the tree. And gold went under the earth. And you, Hublot, you took from the tree gold, uh, rubber, and from under the earth you took gold, and you have put them together, like in the Big Bang. So this concept of fusion, I said, but that's fantastic, because we can mix uh, carbon and diamonds. We can mix uh, 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 red gold and magnesium. There are so many possibilities. And this will help us to be contrarian from the tradition. We want to be an, a, a kind of avant-garde, but still traditional. It means we will not touch uh, quartz, we will do mechanical watches, and we will constantly marry the opposite, yin and yang, cold and hot, gold and rubber, brum, brum, brum. And we will seduce the young generation. And this is why we will go into football, we will go with artists, we will go with rappers. Uh, because we want to be the luxury brand of the new generation, which is very much headed uh, to street art. And luxury is not gold or not platinum. Okay, it's, it's nice gold. I have nothing against gold or platinum. But it's, it's not because the watch is in, is in gold or in platinum that it is a luxury watch. It's not enough. A luxury watch can, can be in plastic. And when I said this to Mr. Carlo Coco, the owner, he said, no, we haven't done this. I said, uh, but have, what have you done? He said, we have done a watch that looks like a porthole. We have given a name Hublot, because Hublot means porthole. And we have put a rubber strap because it was meant uh, the gentleman's watch on the yacht. And on the yacht, you can have some, some uh, seawater, so the best product for a yacht is to have rubber. It's like your shoes with rubber sole. Um, so I said, yes, that's the product. But behind the product, there's a message. And the message is fusion, because you have fused together the rubber and gold. And they were only together before you in the Big Bang. And this is why the next watch we're going to design, which will be the inspiration of the original one, I will call it Big Bang, because that's what the watch has, that's what we are doing. And the concept of Hublot, I want to call it the art of fusion. Once this was clear, then you have the highway, then it's easy to drive. <laughs> How long did it take you to uh, design that first uh, Big Bang? We designed it together with Miat, Miat Design, uh, who had designed all the Blancpain watches for me. He had designed a uh, lot of Omega watches, and he has always been my designer. And so uh, I asked Miat, with Ricardo Guadalupe, the actual CEO, the three of us were sitting together, and we said, Porsche in 1980, that's the design they had. 
And that's the design of the Hublot watch. 1980 Hublot, 1980 Porsche. 2004 Porsche, wow. Still called 911, still the same, but goddamn, totally different. And the Hublot, 1982, uh, 1980, 80. and today, still the same. We said, but look, the evolution, the facelifts of the car has brought a totally different car, more masculine, macho, strong, bam, bam, powerful, but still the same shape. And the watch has remained the same, 32 millimeters, 33. We have to bring to this watch all the facelifts that Porsche did, and we have to do the same facelift for the watch, and we will see what we're going to have in 2004. So we only had to fill 1980, 81, 83, blah, 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 every year, and to bring the facelifts, and we came out with the Big Bang. And because we did this, we were immediately successful, because that, that was so right to do that. It was, it was essential to do it. On the, the communication aspects of all this, uh, these changes, I mean, there also you went into uh, I mean, different routes than the yes. usual luxury brand. Totally different routes. We were uh, totally different. We had other ambassadors. Uh, just one example, which is the biggest probably in, in the history of Hublot. Uh, no, not probably, which is the biggest in the history of Hublot, but also the biggest in the history of luxury. We went to Soka. And Soka in 2004 was not considered as being luxury. And everybody said, are you crazy? You're going to Soka. Look what is Soka. Soka is full of racism. It's the young... Uh, uh, underground people, I said, no, there's an evolution. No, 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 and football is not for luxury. We said, okay, we go. We are contrarian. We must be first, different, unique. And so if we are the first, different, and unique in football, we're going to have a place, and we have to go into football for at least 20 years. And people say, you want to commit 20 years? I said, yes. And we committed till 2022. We committed from 2006 to 2022. I have to say that uh, during the last World Cup, <laughs> you were quite visible. Enormous, yeah. enormous, enormous. And uh, yesterday we, we signed with uh, Mbappé, which is the, the future legend. We have the legend of yesterday, of the last century, which is Pelé. And we have the uh, legend of this century, which is Mbappé. And we signed Mbappé because he wanted to sign with us. It's not that we went to him. He loved Hublot, I met his mother, and uh, his mother said he will never sign another brand than Hublot because he's such a pure guy when he likes something. Either he will never want it differently, he, he, and, and if he has to buy, he's gonna buy. And then we signed another great contract with Ferrari. You cannot, you cannot have a better partner than Ferrari if you are a high quality luxury brand. You could have expected, because it's in Switzerland, that Euro 2008 would have had a Swiss watch brand as a timekeeper. None wanted to be a timekeeper of this sport. They all said no, but we said yes. So when nobody wants to join from the watch business, and you are the only one, you can handle the price in a total different way than if everybody wants to go into football. Voilà. Which means we didn't have much money, but we took the risk to go into football and we put all our money in football. Of course, if now you want to go, I say anything, to, to tennis, with Rolex being uh, in every Grand Slam everywhere, and then you have Nadal with the, uh, with the um, Richard Mille, uh, you will pay a certain price if you want to have now a position. But that was not our case. So, you know, that's why I say to small brands, come on, guys, with ideas, you can save money. Bernie Eccleston, when uh, Valerie visit, visited him at the hospital, because we were, I was, uh, we had quite a friendly relation, 
he's still a good friend of mine. And she went to the hospital to say hello because she was in London. And she saw, he, uh, uh, he saw that she was shocked by his face. And he said, <laughs> you are shocked by how I look. Can you imagine what they did for uh, your watch? And uh, she said, yes, Bernie, I'm sorry. Uh, as they have stolen your watch, I bring you a new one. <laughs> and he said, but you know, I have an idea. The way I look, maybe you should do an ad. And she said, no, you're crazy, Bernie. You're joking. He said, no, I'm not joking. I'm going to call Jean-Claude. And he called me. And he said, have you seen the picture, how I look now? And I said, yeah, Valerie just sent me uh, an SMS. I want, I want you to do a campaign. And I will write on the campaign, look what they have done for, uh, because of my hublot. I said, are you serious, Bernie? Yes! And you will agree, Jean-Claude, you are like me. You are controversial, you are disruptive. That is what we should do. And we did the campaign. <laughs> so it was, I was lucky that he suggested. It was not me. And then we had a lot of negative comments with people writing to me, who are you to use a poor man that has been <laughs> injured to make advertisement for your bloody product? And I had to write back, no, it's not me. It's Mr. Er Ernie. And Ernie said to me, whoever writes to you, I will answer. And he answered to some people. He answered, I remember, to a, an Indian guy who wrote a, sad, a bad uh, a comment, uh, uh, lecture, uh, writer's comment in the Financial Times. And Bernie answered to him <laughs> that it was his decision to be in the, in the ad. Okay, hope you liked it uh, so far and second part of this interview will be shortly published. All the very best to you and viva watchmaking! Thank you.